This is part three of our little book entitled A Closer Look at First Peter. And it begins with the word wherein, which refers back to verse five of chapter one, the salvation wherein we greatly rejoice is what we're talking about. So beginning in First Peter chapter one, verse six, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been put to grief in manifold trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it's been proved by fire, may be found unto praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In verses 6 and 7, we're first introduced to what the German theologians call the sitz in Leben, the situation in life of those who originally received this letter from Peter. These Christians were being persecuted simply because they were followers of Jesus. While James hints at some difficulties of this kind, when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, Peter's going to be much more specific as the letter unfolds. It must have been difficult for the apostles to feel so connected and so protective of their flock but unable to be with them in person. They can, however, remind the sheep that their suffering is precious and life-forming. Gold refined in the fire, used to separate the impurities, is a fitting description of a life lived for no other reason than to bring glory to God through Christ. However, Peter's point is not that the worth of the new life in Christ is equal to such gold, but that it's worth even more than the purest of gold. Verse 8, Whom not having seen, you love. On whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice greatly with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Here we learn a bit more about the identity of the audience. Though Peter spent three years of his adult life traveling with and learning from the Master, his readers had not been blessed with the opportunity to see Jesus in the flesh. Some conclude that this opens the possibility that his readers were Gentiles, but there are other better explanations. Perhaps the audience is comprised of Jewish travelers who met the message at Pentecost, 50 days too late to meet the Master before his death and resurrection. Or perhaps they represent Jews who were living away from Jerusalem and found the truth through the missionary outreach of men like Paul and Barnabas and Silas and others. The main point is not that they have not seen Jesus, but that they love him and trust him anyway. Perhaps Peter has in mind the second coming when he says, now you see him not. They had not seen Jesus during his earthly ministry, nor did they have the opportunity to see him during their present walk of persecution. But they look forward to seeing him when he returns. Jesus himself offers hope and encouragement to those of us who have never seen his physical presence. When Thomas, who's sometimes known as Doubting Thomas, finally sees the Savior after the Lord's resurrection, he blurts out a very famous confession, My Lord and my God, to which Jesus replies, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 10. Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them was pointing to when it testified beforehand the sufferings of the Christ and the glories that should follow them, to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto you did they minister these things, which now have been announced unto you through them that preach the gospel unto you by the Holy Spirit sent forth from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. Uh, having grown up looking up to the prophets and other heroes of the Old and New Testaments, came as a bit of a surprise when I first recognized this fact. 
Those guys, given special, special knowledge and understanding by the Holy Spirit, to speak of things that would not happen for hundreds of years, that point of time they were trying to discover was a long way off, were amazingly ignorant when compared to the modern believer. They were given glimpses, but those who came to faith after Jesus was raised from the dead know infinitely more about the overall plan of God for redeeming mankind. It's not only those earthbound ambassadors that lacked complete understanding. Peter goes on to say that even angels themselves wish that they could understand. Perhaps it is the whole concept of redemption that interests them. The writer of Hebrews makes several interesting statements about angels. First, he reminds his readers that angels are servants to those who are being saved. He then goes on to say that Jesus did not take on the flesh of angels to die on their behalf. Instead, he took on human flesh to become the savior of human creation. So I imagine the angels are interested to know what Jesus did, the very son of God, become human flesh on our behalf. Verse 13, Wherefore, girding up the loins of your mind, be sober and set your hope perfectly on the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As children of obedience, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in the time of your ignorance, but like as he who called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living, because it is written, you shall be holy because I am holy. I find this section interesting because of the relationship between grace, that is, unmerited favor, and the call to gird up your loins, be sober, live obediently, be holy. Modern theology often finds a disconnect between the idea of grace and an ongoing lifestyle of obedient service. For those suffering through times of persecution, the reminder that grace has been given them through Jesus Christ brings true comfort and encouragement to go on living the changed lifestyle that such grace calls for. It would have been so much easier to live according to the former lusts, as Peter calls them, to just go along and get along with the people that were around them. Many in our own generation have chosen such a path and have traded in the holy for the common. More later. <laughs>